latency numbers that every programmer should know. As a, as a software engineer, as a programmer, you need to know how long it takes certain activities or tasks for the computer to achieve a certain operation or a completeness. Guess what? Some things are really fast. Really, really fast. Those other things are pretty slow, but these days, computers, they're really fast. So if we were to take a look and see what the current list of operations are available for accessing different parts of a computer and completing those operations, which one do you think is going to be the fastest? We've got one nanosecond here, and I'm, I, I know, I know it's going to be something to do with the CPU, right? It's got to be something to do with the CPU. Well, if we look at it, it's actually going to be accessing memory in the L1 cache layer. L1 cache is the smallest and fastest type of cache memory available. It's embedded directly into the CPU with all of its logic gates. So that means that it can operate at the same speed as the CPU itself. It looks like we got two types of L1 cache. We've got L1 cache for instructions, which are the computer the computer code, the instructions for operating the application itself. And then we've also got data storage for storing data, probably on the stack and things like that. Or maybe very temporary small things. L1 cache is, uh, you can't have too much because it is right there within on the CPU itself right next to like it's embedded directly into so there's um, only so many transistors that you can cram together and either they're going to be logic operators or they're going to be some storage and you've got them side by side so you need to have you want enough speed and enough storage available but if you need even more storage then you're going to have to go to a higher level of caching l1 cache is the fastest i want why can't everything be l1 cache well, we kind of figured out why, because L1 cache, you just have, there's only there's only so much room for logic, like pro actually processing your application versus storing data itself and accessing the applications and all of its instructions. So that's why you can only have so much L1 cache. I want more, I want more L1 cache. I want everything to be L1 cache, maybe someday. In computer programming, what is the next fastest thing compared to L1 cache? We know that L1 cache is really fast. It's like one of the fastest things that are ca capable within a CPU. There is another set of instructions, another kind of unit that is the next level slower and what is that i mean you probably would say l2 cache but there's there's one thing that jumps at us here first it's called branch misprediction that kind of seems like counter like why would you want to a misprediction that sounds like a mistake like a whoops oh and why does that count is it well actually this is actually pretty important because as, in, as a cpu there are acceleration patterns that work really really well such as branch prediction that allows CPUs to accelerate and go faster by calculating paths ahead of time. What is meant by branch prediction? Branch prediction is a technique to predict the outcome of a conditional operation. And then what it can do is it can continue to execute down the path, allowing it to conclude and provide a, a lot faster compute cycles. And this is done through a branch prediction unit, which is a BPU. BPUs can predict which branch of code will be chosen with a high confidence given the current encoded instructions. Now a misprediction, which is at three nanosecond, right? So we've got we've got uh, three nanoseconds here, that misprediction. So say the branch guesses, but it got it wrong. It speculatively executed a partial uh, instruction. And then what it has to do is discard the pipeline and start all over. It's only three nanoseconds. So you can you can do this quite a few times. You can make enough mistakes and get it wrong and throw away the output and still provide a much faster CPU. Say, for example, if you got it right 90% of the time even, even 80% of the time, you can still provide a faster CPU by using branch prediction. If L1 cache is one nanosecond latency, then how fast is L2 cache, L2 cache. I mean, you kind of think, okay, I guess this is gonna, since L1 cache is already super duper fast and is the fastest, wouldn't L2 cache be just a little bit slower? Yeah, it is. Do you th how much slower do you think it'll be? Let's check it out. We've got four nanos, so four times slower. Although in the nanosecond range, it's pretty darn fast, right? You can get a lot of, you can fetch from L2 cache a lot with uh, four nanoseconds and still provide a really fast user experience. We know that L1 cache is sitting side by side with the instruction sets of the CPU, which helps it perform really fast. Like it's as fast as you possibly can get because the memory for the code execution and data is basically right next to each other. Now L2 cache is located uh, a little bit above that, right? So now you're gonna have larger pools uh, available, sort of like these bays that are above those logics those logic circuits, uh, but it's going to be a little bit more distant in the hop and you also have lookup tables. So it takes a little bit more time, four times slower, but four nanoseconds, that's pretty good. Mutex locks and unlocks. There is some latency there. What is even a mutex lock and unlock? And in computer science, 
For concurrency, when we're computing between different threads, we want to access the same memory between threads, and you can't do that unless you have some guardrails in place. This is what mutex locks and unlocks are for, and there is a latency incursion for locking and unlocking access to memory between threads. This prevents undefined behavior where data can be read from incompletely, or it can be written to and overwritten in between competing threads. What's the latency? I want to check out the latency really close. 17 nanosecond. Okay, well, that's a lot. That's a lot faster than what I was thinking. I mean, so for example, if you have, if you've got a lot of threads and you're accessing the same memory and that memory is, you know, continuously changing, this is a, a pretty decent pattern. You want to use a mutex for that. In 17 nanoseconds, that's not a whole, that's not a whole lot. That means you can lock and unlock quite a few times and still have a really performant application. Another common pattern in concurrency is leveraging something called channels or the ability to pass data between threads. Now that kind of concurrency, it can scale better and it can deal with other kinds of, of data a little bit more efficiently. However, mutex locks and unlocks, I think is gonna significantly outperform those kinds of patterns at a smaller scale when you're when you're leveraging just one one compute unit. If you're distributing a workload across a large number of, of CPUs, like hundreds of CPUs, you will probably benefit from message passing because this can happen at scale. However, for, for a type of scenario where you have a, a thread, a whole bunch of threads that need to read and write to the same memory address, a mutex lock, this is actually pretty performant. I'm pretty happy about that. That's 17 nanoseconds. You can do, how, how many can you get per second? Oh, probably a lot. Uh, almost almost, almost uh, 59 times per millisecond you can do. Also, this that was in 2020 processors. Does it get any better in 2020? Yeah, 2023. A little bit, a little bit better. Oh, 2024. Oh, uh, significantly better. Oh, wait, I'm looking at here. We need to look at the, oh, mute. Oh, I got tricked. I got tricked. Okay. So networking, sending one kilobyte is actually faster in 2024 than locking and unlocking a mutex. All right. So mutex lock and locks, it's staying the same it's, over the years. It's the same speed. It's still pretty darn fast. But uh, look at sending one kilobyte. That's actually pretty darn quick. These are latency numbers that every programmer should know. We're going to get through the rest of these. We saw a lot of different latency numbers that you should know. If we're going to check it out, we already went through L1 cache, which is at uh, one nanosecond. Branch prediction, misprediction, three nanoseconds. We got L2 cache at four nanoseconds, four times slower than L1. Mutex lock and unlock, that's 17 nanoseconds. Sending one kilobyte of data over one gigabit network in 2024 today is only 11 nanoseconds that's pretty fast and now i'm curious i'm super curious main memory reference so now we're going to access the main system memory where you've got like gigabytes and terabytes of ram uh accessibility here and that's a uh, 100 nanoseconds all right that's a lot slower than l2 l2 cache right so now you can only do that 10 times per millisecond, which is still pretty fast, right? A millisecond's pretty quick. Oh, wait, no, I got I got my order of uh, my magnitudes off. All right, microsecond and nanosecond. There's a little bit of difference there. I was saying that wrong. All right, so we've got, we can do, all right, so nanoseconds are really, really fast versus uh, microseconds, which is right below a millisecond. All right, so this is, this this access is pretty fast. Nanosecond, that's quite, a, that's quite, that's you can do that a lot of times. So a thousand, so you can access main memory about 10,000 times per millisecond, which is amazing. And then one, two, three, 10 million times per second. That's a lot. That's amazingly fast. All right, now you can read one megabyte of sequential memory uh, in about one microsecond. You can compress 1K bytes within Zippy in about two mi- Wow, really? That's neat. I didn't know you could do that. In about two microseconds. Read four kilobytes of randomly from an SSD, so your hard drive, in about 16 microseconds. You could sequentially read one megabyte, so sequential, like all at once, in about 19 microseconds. That's quite a bit. That's really fast. You can read one megabyte sequentially from disk. All right, so disk, we're going to be our original spindle disks. So how quick can we do that? Oh, all right, that's a lot slower. SSDs are really fast. That is amazingly slower, like 25 times slower. 25 times slower. That's ridiculous. A network round trip within the same data center is uh, about a half of a millisecond. Disk seek is two milliseconds. Ouch, right? Those spin disks. They take extra, extra time. Finally, let's go to the WAN, the wide area net, right? Where the internet is, the internet at large. So if we send a packet from California to the Netherlands, back to the California, so we're spinning 
distances here. How fast do you think that is? How long do you think it... I'm pretty sure we're in the millisecond range, at least at this point, but is it tens of milliseconds? No, it's gonna be hundreds of milliseconds, isn't it? 150 milliseconds. Send a packet from California to the Netherlands, back to California. That's a 150 millisecond round trip. I still think it's ridiculously impressive that the network speed of today is so much faster in many of the cases. The network itself is just so much faster. That's pretty neat. Those are the, uh, the latency numbers every programmer should know.